Water, good stuff. You have to hydrate. Um, a shout out to the aircraft carrier boys and women that uh, keep us going and, uh, and safe, and thank you for watching. Uh, and a shout out to uh, both Doro and Tricia for having me, as well as Claire, who sponsored me. Um, my God, it looks radically different from this point of view than the other way around. Um, all right. So after I get over my little anxiety crisis, oh yeah, isynchrony. Okay. Um, we're here about brain health. And the big problem with brain health is that when something goes wrong with the brain, you don't see it. You simply don't see it. As you slide out of homeostasis, you still don't see it. Nobody around you sees it. It's not like a broken leg, right? You got a cast, plus you can't walk. But you can have all sorts of mental disorders and sort of willpower your way through the day. Never taking the time to sit back and say, what the hell is wrong with me, okay? And the reality is most of us, uh, once we're past our youth, uh, there is something wrong with us. And the reason is A, stress, and B, poor sleep. Uh, we're gonna get into all the transcranial magnetic stuff in a little bit, but uh, let's, let's get down to brass tacks. If you're not sleeping eight hours and they're not a quality eight hours where you're getting down into deep sleep and REM sleep, which are otherwise known for the technical folks as uh, uh, REM sleep and uh, stage four sleep, uh, the simple truth is your brain is not regenerating for the next day. If you're not regenerating for the next day, guess how much you're in deficit at the end of the second night and the third night and the fourth night? And what about week after week, month after month? And it gets worse, okay? Not only are you not regenerating, if you're not very careful about maintaining your sleep-wake cycle, that circadian rhythm, you know, that thing that says, oh God, I'm sleepy because it's night out, and oh God, I'm waking up because it's morning, um, which is actually a super chasmatic nucleus in the back of the brain for those that want the technical stuff, and it's keyed off the blue light of morning sunshine. Um, the clock in there, ain't all that good. You're a biologic organism. If you're plus or minus 20% anything, that's fantastic. Now, don't get me wrong. There are things that operate in the body at much greater tolerances than, you know, one over 24, okay? But your circadian rhythm ain't one of them. In fact, technically, it's 45 minutes forward in terms of how it's skewed. And so let's say that you don't get your circadian rhythm synced by sunlight and blue, sc blue sky for, oh, I don't know, 10 days, which routinely happens, right? You know, you get up, you go into the car, you go into artificial lighting at work, you get out after the sun is down, you're in artificial lighting again, you go back to sleep, okay? And you're never getting that synchronization pulse from outside. Okay, let's face it. Our ancestors 50,000, 500,000 years ago did not have the clock bell tower. Right? So what happened? Sunlight would hit. They'd leave the cave or the hut, or if you were in Mesopotamia, something that looked like a, a, a house. OK? And you walked outside, and oh god, sunlight and blue sky, and you're synced for that day. And you're synced every day. Your biologic organism that was expected every day to get up get out and get some sunshine, do your daily activities, and then as soon as the sun went down, okay, time to sleep. Or sex and time to sleep. Either way, okay? That's how it, that's how it basically went, all right? Because otherwise none of us would be here. So... Are there still people up here? You have to go down to brass tacks sometimes. Fundamentals are fundamental, okay? You know, in fact, there's something even more fundamental than fundamentals. They're called universals. Okay, let me give you some of the universals. Oxygen, water, food. Not necessarily in that order, but you damn well ha better have some oxygen up front, right? Uh, how long do you last without oxygen? Anyone? Oh, God, five minutes? Let, let's, let's try to hold our breath for five minutes. Let's see who succeeds. So why am I going down this, this path? I'm going down this path because we've forgotten most of the fundamentals. Uh, one thing I have to you know, uh, congratulate all the speakers up to this point is that they kept throwing fundamentals at you, okay, no matter what aspect of it was. You know? uh, even the gentleman who was the wounded warrior was throwing fundamentals at you, except he was throwing fundamentals of what happens out on a battlefield. Okay? You, and this ties in with what I'm going to talk about later because PTSD is a big, big, big deal. By the way, 
we're going to take another short detour and then bring it all back together. Okay. Um, there are 800,000 victims of PTSD in the military alone. Throw in victims of sexual abuse, any other kind of trauma, that number rises up to around two, two and a half million. Nobody has the, the really good statistics on it. But speaking solely about PTSD for veterans, okay, we could cure all PTSD veterans for between four and eight billion dollars, okay? Just using the technology I'm gonna talk about, all right? Now, it's even cheaper if you can set, figure out ones that will respond to medication versus those that don't, except we throw all these medications at them. And the average PTSD veteran that has shown up at my clinic and then at the, uh, at the clinic that I was part of on the uh, West Coast used to show up with 10 medications. Does anyone in this audience think that 10 medications actually has a positive outcome anywhere in the world? No. no. Okay, why not? Well, first of all, because at the end of the day, you're giving a medication to, to change a symptom that was created by another medication, okay, or a downstream parallel problem, at which point they're at six, seven, eight, nine, ten meds, okay, and in fact, one guy came in with 18 uh, back, back west, and uh, we, ne we nearly all freaked because, you know, how, just the medication interaction list, you know, said he should be dead. Okay, and he's sitting talking to me, you know, with a little bit of sweat on his forehead. And I'm like, you know what, let me get you over to our, our resident physician and, and he'll start cleaning up this med list for you. Um, it's a real problem, okay? We've forgotten fundamentals. We want proof beyond a reasonable doubt. If we applied the standard of courtrooms to medicine, we'd be far, far further along. We've reached a point where the FDA requires, well, if you don't have a double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled trial of about 1,000 patients, your results aren't valid. Poppycock. Poppycock. If I take 200 veterans and I have a 99% response rate that's durable at six months, okay, the best the literature has achieved is 50%. That's Dr. Steven Zanakis, a brigadier general and, and, and psychiatrist, okay? So that means, in my series of folks that crash landed at the Brain Treatment Center back in the day, that I had 100 consecutive train wrecks, which had been thrown the kitchen sink at. So much for placebo, right? OK. That responded to therapy above and beyond what you would expect if medical process was running optimally, which it wasn't. Does anyone know what the odds of that simple 200 consecutive patient trial is? I'll tell you. It's 1 over 2 to the 100th. That's 1 over 10 to the 30th. Okay? If you got on a plane at random with those odds, the big crunch of the universe would happen before you would land in a plane crash. Okay? So the idea that we haven't proven this is poppycock. Okay, it drives me absolutely insane that we've thrown the baby out with the bathwater. Okay, logic works. Induction works, okay? Induction really does work in science. How do you think that we got to the point where we have airplanes that basically don't crash? Okay, and even those that should crash somehow manage to land. Okay, you know, the, the actual odds of dying in a plane crash are absurdly low, 0 0.6 per 100,000. If you got on a plane at random, it'd take 10,000 years for you to die in a plane crash. That doesn't mean four planes don't crash every year. That's just because the volume of plane travel is so enormous, okay? But if you're just getting on them at random, I think that's pretty good odds, okay? We should use the same standard in medicine, all right? So let's move forward and start talking about some of the science here and get back to that whole sleep-wake cycle, why it's so important, why you have to protect it, okay? Oh, God, it actually worked, fantastic. Notes from the leading edge. Uh, actually, should read bleeding edge and probably off the damn cliff, too. Um, I sit on the shoulder of giants. There are those who think I'm a giant, but they're wrong. I'm only five foot 10. Uh, the simple truth here is these gentlemen have all been, at one point, instrumental in bringing us to the point where we are. I would like to specifically call out uh, the second name there, Eroy John, uh, who when 
let's face it, they didn't know what they were doing with brains, and it was Eroy John, uh, a physicist and statistician, that uh, created, uh, that was at the first uh, big brain lab at NYU, uh, that put us really on the right path that there was a mathematical way to look at the frequencies running in the brain, and that they all had significance. In fact, the software that he and others have, have written since then uh, have been essential. Now, one of the interesting things about all this is that uh, when I talk about um, individualized transcranial magnetic stimulation to folks, uh, I ask a bunch of questions before I start, and I'm going to hit you with them right now. How many are MDs? Many MDs. Okay, biologists. Okay, some biologists. How many are engineers? Okay, a few more little engineers. How, how many folks had some level of higher math? In other words, you understand the meaning of the word calculus. Excellent. Okay, our educational system hasn't failed us today. It's all math. As far as the brain is concerned, it's all math. Okay, and in the olden days, when we didn't understand a black box, we used to build white boxes to kind of emulate what the black box did in, a, in an attempt to figure out what the heck the damn black box was doing. With re regards to the brain, we have so many white boxes, you have no idea. They're called computers, okay? All the principles that apply in signal processing to computers apply in, uh, in the brain. Um, and there's a small funny anecdote associated with all of this because, uh, and the carrier group will probably be more interested in this than you. Um, a long time ago, uh, this MD somehow ended up finding weapons of mass destruction from orbit. Uh, and it was all math. And um, the interesting thing about that is that everything I did to find weapons of mass destruction from orbit, and it's a long story how I got there, um, applies to the brain. The same mathematics, the same anomaly detection, the same type of algorithms, they're all there, okay? And so when people say, but you're flying blind. No, I'm not. I know exactly where I am. Are you imminent? I'm going to take it. Um, this is what we do. This is what we do. I think I have 13 minutes left. Um, we do autism. We do PTSD. We do concussion different flavor of traumatic brain injury. It's more a matter of degree. Um, opiate withdrawal. We can usually give somebody suffering from opiate abuses uh, a soft landing. It takes six weeks, and, but they get a soft landing. No withdrawals, no cravings, no wish or desire to, to, to you know, get back on the opiate if, if they're truly substance addicted. Most of the time we find out that it's really not. It's that their pain has ratcheted over time, the opiate ratcheted with it, but the actual original insult is healed. We reset the pain threshold back to where it was. It's a thing of beauty. Autism. Now, what I don't understand is why the insurance companies, and the insurance folks, All right, we're sponsored. I think there's Aetna there. Um, I don't understand why the insurance companies haven't come to visit. Any of the three of us cats that are doing that, okay? There's a, a two clinics in, uh, in California and another one, uh, uh, in, two in Taiwan. Um, last time I looked, autism is considered an intractable problem by medicine. The so-called natural reversion best case is 10% per decade. It's in the literature, you can find it. But the reality is, how many do we know that have reverted? Very, very few. Um, as a general rule, we can get a third to neurotypicality. We can get a third of them to have a very big bump. Okay, I mean, this is the difference between severe autism and moderate, moderate and mild. Of course, if I got a mild and he gets the one-third bump, you know, he's, he's neurotypical. Um, and a third will fail therapy. I suspect whatever gave them the autism is still, still active because, technically speaking, it's physics in that case, and they should be there, too. We stop at one week if, uh, if we can't do it. 
But the third that go to neurotypicality, it's a wonderful thing. You have essentially a normal child. Don't get me wrong, if you did an extensive neuro battery exam, you'd find all sorts of small deficits. But as far as being a happy child, being a child that can interact socially, being a child that can cognitively function and learn and keep learning, uh, they're out of the gate. PTSD. PTSD is near and dear to my heart uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, we have way too many folks with PTSD. We are gangbusters with PTSD. The simple truth of the matter is that 99% uh, will respond, and they will respond well. Approximately 1 in 20 will fall off the wagon uh, because they don't protect their sleep-wake cycle. Now, PTSD is the reason why we talk about sleep-wake cycles. It's important in the other conditions as well, but it's crucial here. The first thing that happens, guess who owns the night carrier group? We do. Okay, we own the night. We do night missions. Okay, guess whose circadian rhythms get blown out as the first aspect of combat duty? Our veterans. They never recover from that. They never recover from that. The moment that your brain cannot regenerate that at night, they're prone to something else. Now, you have to understand, if you're put in a sublethal situation, if Bob is dropped in a sublethal situation, Bob dies. Why? Because Bob's not prepared for it. These folks have been trained. They know what they're doing. And if you mistake a rock for a bear, no big deal, right? It's when you mistake the bear for a rock that it's a problem. Okay, so these folks are in a sublethal situation all the time, and they become hypervigilant and hyperaware, and they never recover from that. They end up in an energetic cul-de-sac where they can't escape. Okay, so by the time they're done with their military service, they are locked in this hypervigilance, hyperanxiety mode where they have to always be facing the door to make sure that no threat comes in. Every single person that they look at, you know, they evaluate to understand, it, it, are they a friend or are they a foe? Okay, where are my exits? Is that, does that bag have a uh, bomb in it? Okay, is someone gonna come through this exit door uh, with, a, with an AK-47 and, and, and shoot me? Uh, is there a possibility of an IED device, you know, somewhere around here? Okay, they go through that as a natural aspect of being in condition yellow, condition red all the time. Suddenly we drop them back in civil society where you're, we're all in condition white. Nobody here is expecting you know, terrorists to come through the door. They are. It's not their fault. They're in a state of hypervigilance and hyperanxiety. In any event, individual, transmit, bleh, individual transcranial magnetic stimulation, which is synced to how their brain is supposed to operate, unwinds it. You want to, Anyone want to take a guess at what the first thing that happens three to five days in when we start treating them? Anybody? It's sleep. It's sleep. Okay. They all come in and say the same exact thing. For the first time in 5, 10, 15, 25, 30 years, imagine where the person is on the 30-year mark, right? Um, I slept like a child. I slept 12 hours. Now, they slide back to normal rhythm over time, but those first few days, they'll sleep, you know, 12, 13, 14 hours. Same thing is true in concussions, um, which is a different, different disorder there, but once again, that, that conductor, that beat that drives the brain has been uh, annihilated. So what can you do to keep your sleep? First of all, you have to sleep cold. Turns out that we like to have warm rooms, but that's not the best way to sleep, okay? Your core body temperature actually has to drop in order for you to go to the deepest, deepest sleep. So keep it slightly cool. Get an extra blanket if you have to, okay? You have to get sunlight every day. I don't care how you get the sunlight. Get it. That's the healthiest way. If you positively have to run to work, okay, look up the LEDs that you put in fish tanks. A blue LED for a fish tank is exactly the uh, right frequency by which we can uh, resync our rhythm. And basically, put that fish tank light where you have breakfast. Now, don't stare into it. You know, it can just go off. It just can, you know, you, 
put it against the wall, the refracted light is sufficient to induce that, that little sink. And then make sure you go to bed every night at the same time, okay? It only takes about 20 days to get, get the rhythm if you're completely, you know, and for the disciplined few out there, eh, I won't. I was gonna say, who thinks they're disciplined, but we won't do that. Um, just go to bed at the same time. And start early. Around 8 p.m., start shutting down the lights, you know? Uh, get up, if you use a lot of devices, devices are killers, because guess what the blue phosphor is on the devices? Yeah, it's exactly like the blue light of the sky. In fact, that's why they selected that frequency, right? It's the most pleasant blue the human race has ever seen. We evolved with it, okay? So it's the same blue that's on your cell phone, it's the same blue that's on your TV, and it's the same blue that's on your laptop. Now, TV isn't all that bad because it's always constantly changing, okay? Not true of your, of your screens, where blue is a very common component, and not true on your laptops, where blue is a common component. Get an application, and you can find them, just blue light screener or blue light, blue light remover or something along those lines. Google it in whatever Play Store, and sure enough, it will come up. Put it on your laptop and make sure that around 8 p.m. it starts slicing out the blue phosphors. Whoops, wrong way. We're gangbusters with, T with uh, PTSD, okay? Basically, upper left-hand corner is suicidal, and down here on this side, it's basically, you know what, I can get through the day quite well. And this is what a brain that looks like when it goes from being a extreme situation of PTSD to a quite normal brain. Um, you can see all these excess frequencies and slow waves and all sorts of goobly gook, okay? Here, around 10 cycles per second, he has a perfect set of waves that go up for every lead of the EEG. Thing of beauty. This is normal, by the way, okay? This is normal. This is what we all should be. We're usually not, unfortunately. We're very good with concussions. Concussions typically uh, blows to the head, uh, loss of consciousness, all those kind of things. Um, the simple truth is uh, what happens is a lot of neurons become very slow. When they become very, very slow, they suck the living life out of you because they're not helping you cogitate. They're not helping you think. By putting the magnet on the brain, we can, in point of fact, get those neurons to move faster and fall into what we call central synchrony. We're also very good with chemo brain. Uh, this is brain fog induced from chemotherapy. Uh, I'm sure that everybody knows somebody with breast cancer, and almost a third of the time, that person is having cognitive difficulties. Those cognitive difficulties are due to the fact that, like I keep telling you, there's this conductor. You think of the brain as an orchestra, and there's a beat that it has to keep. It turns out that um, if you don't have the right beat, or if you have two or three beats, all of a sudden you're, it's like trying to listen to three radio stations. You're, you're confused, and you have all the classic sim symptoms that are listed up there. Okay, turns out you can sync them right up with the magnets uh, and uh, everything re reverts. This is an actual real patient that came to us. Uh, she has this sort of spread out central synchrony and after a mere two weeks on the magnet, she has a nice big monstrous central synchrony and virtually all her symptoms had uh, completely um, resolved. Two weeks skip depression and anxiety. This is technically what we call neuromodulation. Unfortunately, it's 20 minutes, I got five to go. No matter what it's called, um, it's called neuromodulation. We are literally getting in there and doing what the neurosurgeons do. Where's our neurosurgeon, by the way? Didn't we have a neurosurgeon? I could have sworn we had a neurosurgeon. Uh, be that as it may, neurosurgeons are very familiar with neuromodulation, except they do it surgically. They literally put an electrode in and uh, the net result is they make neurons move the way they want to by having an electrode literally sitting on top of the, uh, of the uh, brain. Uh, we do the exact same thing, except we do it from the outside with powerfully synchronized ma uh, magnetic fields. Um, we're cheating. 
we're going straight to the hardware. None of this talk therapy, although we have that. None of all the medication sides, you know, worrying about neurotransmitters. We don't worry about that as a general rule. If we have to add in medications, we do that later. Okay, we're technically a fully device-oriented uh, way of doing it, and we cheat. We look to exactly see where that central synchrony isn't, isn't running, and we, we reinstitute it. And this is basically where we go. We're trying to find and restore this central synchrony. At the end of the day, I want all the patients at the clinic to look exactly like this when we're, when we're on the outskirts. Um, let's get that. This is actually a patient with autism, um, and these are the kind of changes that, that you can expect, where we take essentially a brain, and you see these, these colored diagrams, these are called topographs. Your nose is at the, at the top of the, uh, the screen. Uh, that blackness that you see is the lack of central synchrony in children with autism. So everything about therapy is reinducing that central synchrony, and that's what we end up with, which is almost normal. And does it work? Yes, it does. Um, we do, we <laughs> no, it, it's, it's crazy, you know, people that, where's your double-blind randomized placebo-controlled trial? All right. Oh, no, it's not on this slide. Rats. <laughs> Rats. Although it should be. I don't know how it's not here. There's supposed to be a diagram associated with this one. In any event. Um, Okay, <laughs> we're back at the beginning. Um, I'll read you what we achieved. And uh, so they said, Bob, how can we prove it? And I said, guys, not that hard. Take a whole bunch, let's double blind them, let's put the magnet on for a period of time that we know that some change will happen if it's going to happen, which is six weeks, okay? And then because we're an ethical company, the moment we're done with the double blind six weeks, we're gonna put the magnet on all of the kids and then we'll have a cohort where one bunch has been treated for six weeks and another bunch for 12 weeks. And this is what happened. 12 went to neurotypical. Interestingly enough, we had a pair of twins. One went to neurotypicality and nothing happened in the other. Just goes to show you that it's not all about genetics. Um, five got substantial gains, which in our definition was better than a 30% leap in their uh, cognitive capabilities. Uh, no change in the remaining patients, and two more went to neurotypicality at uh, one year. Nobody on the planet has achieved this, okay? There should have been a damnable stampede to the Brain Treatment Center and then to our place, iSynchrony, because of this, okay? Crickets. Crickets. This isn't some accident. The statistical odds of this happening by chance in a 12-week period are astronomical. The only thing we did was put magnets on the head, okay, and make them go out and get sunlight, all right? That's it, because we wanted them to sleep because they regenerate at, at sleeping. Okay, it should have been a damnable stampede. Crickets, okay, just as it's crickets with PTSD, crickets with concussion, crickets with traumatic brain injury, and crickets with opioid. Okay, the system is broken. Okay, we have four intractable problems, a solution, which by the way has plenty of literature behind it, okay? Since 1985, people have been playing with this. There are studies at Harvard, at Stanford, at Chicago. They're not doing precisely what we're doing, but there's a mountain of stuff that says, you know, there be gold in, the, in these hills, okay? Crickets, all right? So, in conclusion, as far as this working, it works. It works really well, and it works in a non-pharmacologic way. Okay, this is one of those things which is absolutely fantastic where you actually get to do good and send patients away feeling better when they, they came in, okay? And we're a specialist clinic. This is all we do. This is what we do every day, okay? And we have legions of examples. And we can even do some things that technically medicine says can't be done, which is reverse strokes, okay? We, we even had a patient who had fallen on her head 
uh, eight years ago. Okay, her brain, they had to open her brain. It swelled out, they swelled back in, they closed the brain with a little bit of metal too. Okay, she came to us, couldn't lift up her arm, couldn't, didn't have grip strength, and had a left foot, you know, interning palsy. Okay, and, and, and slurred speech. She left speaking well, no foot palsy, being able to bear weight again, have enough grip strength to do activities of daily living, so much so that she didn't need her nurse assistant anymore, could bathe herself, and is now exercising. But I'm the crazy one. No, seriously, this is why I began with the system is broken, and now I'm closing with the system is broken, okay? It's ridiculous that we can do these kind of things and nobody steps up to the plate. It, it's strange to me as, as someone that was trained in the early 80s, you know, where we used, I would have killed to have this in 1989. I would have killed to have this. When I rotated through neurosurgery, all I had at the end of the day after saving somebody's life was the poor bastard. Because I knew that, you know, beyond a certain point, he wasn't going to get better. In any event, uh, like I said, get your sunlight, get your sleep. Uh, by the way, theanine is a fantastic supplement. Use it. Uh, it's the active ingredient in green tea. Uh, knocks you out like you wouldn't believe, as strong as Valium without the side effects. I thank you so much for your time, and I thank you for the indulgence.